Hello. Today, as one of our first lectures in, for this honors class, I'm going to give you a very quick, so I'm sure there are things missing as well in this PowerPoint presentation, rundown about how play is understood in scholarly work and especially with a special attention to game studies. Game studies is a field which really started to take off around the year 2000, but has a bigger or longer history than only that year. But 2000 was an important year because certain things uh, which started to happen gave shape to game studies or video game studies as a field. And one of that was in 2001, I'm saying about the, uh, the turn of the century, um, a group of uh, Northern European scholars started to put games on the agenda and started also a journal uh, dedicated to games, a computer game studies journal. And in that, one of the main people in that group, Espen Arset, wrote an article in which he said 2001, so a year later than 2000, as I just said, can be seen as the year one of computer game studies as an emerging, viable, international academic field. Of course, as I just already mentioned, games have a longer tradition and we shouldn't only see them as di digital anyway, um, but it became a field around 2000 because of journals like the one I just mentioned, conferences which were organized, which were dedicated to it, and also scholars, like I said, especially the Nordic European scholars, um, who started to study them. And of course, there was a reason for that. Video games became very important uh, for younger people, especially, and became part of quotidian or daily life. Now, this is a bit uh, a summary of what Arset says in this article uh, I just mentioned. He says, actually, he makes a very big um, sort of point out of uh, making, uh, showing that video games are different from other big media, you could say. Because, of course, he saw at that moment that people from cinema studies, for example, try to colonize games within their field and use too much, he thought, of their theories and methods to understand them. And he said they're very different from other media because opposed to them, you can't, you can't speak of a big group of people playing games, but you can't really speak of an audience, let alone of a mass audience, because everybody relates to uh, games in a very personal way through playing them. So those shared values um, and sort of monolithic markets are not there. So there are no mass audiences. And, and that's interesting that he said that in 2001, because, of course, now we know with Discord and, and, and techniques like that, uh, that's even more the case. Communication is not only a sort of sender-receiver model, but also there's, there's a possibility of participants communicating with each other. Also, I said conferences, it's an interesting moment which I was able to witness at that time and age. In 2003, the Digital Game Research Conference um, was held, the first one, and that was held in the Netherlands, in Utrecht, where I was working at that time. DIGRA, you can look it up on the internet, have a vast archive of all these conference proceedings which have been published uh, since 2000, 2003. And this one was in Utrecht, and as you can already see from the captures underneath that, it was already a vers very versatile field then, ranging from formal ideas about games to things like gender, but also diversity, and also already ludology as a field which is bigger than games, which are often seen as rule-bound only, but how play is immersed in, uh, or dispersed in different ways in our culture. Um, to go back to Arset, why is he such an important person uh, when you start to want to understand how game studies came about? Um, Arset wrote a dissertation which was later published as a book 
um, which was called Allegories of Space, in which he compares all the med media and uh, also including literature with uh, games. And what he says is important also in relation to this course because he said the defining element in computer games is spatiality. So, indeed, if you play a game, whether it's a board game, a game when you are a child on the street, or a computer game, uh, mostly you um, advance in the game through exploring space. And later in this course, we will also make the connection between exploring space and the idea of colonialism. But despite or also outside of that whole cultural um, uh, interpretation of what that can mean, it is true that through spatial uh, movements, one makes uh, a game or plays a game. And that has consequences uh, for also on a temporal level. Because, and this is another person who was important then and still in the field, when we compare games uh, or playing with other um, media, there's an interesting uh, shift in how, um, how uh, time plays out, so to speak. So if we talk about narrative and we sort of equate that with, um, with literature, it's very much about reading about something which has happened. So the emphasis is on the past. With drama, in the moment of performance, it's very much uh, uh, triggered or focused on the present, on what's happening there in front of you as a spectator. And what Frosca says, with games, there's something else happening. You, it's very much future-driven because you're simulating a space in which you sort of move forward. So you leave everything behind and you're actually very much in the mode when you are doing a game in moving forward and creating a future act activity. That does not mean, as we will also see in the time travel uh, lecture, uh, which will which you will, uh, can, can look at later, that um, the past is gone out of this, but actually through this forward-moving um, um, yeah, activity, you can create or play with the past as well. And indeed, with time travel is a very, very strong example of that. You move through space, but you move back in time, for example. So there are all these ways you can play with that, but the basic activity is forward-driven, a future activity. And that, according to both Frosca and uh, Arset, makes games and plays stand apart from other cultural expressions and media. Okay, around 2000, as I said already, that game studies field became big, huge actually, and uh, games became, of course, huge as part of our cultural um, expressions. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't anyone before that who thought about games and play. And those, as to use a very gendered uh, notion, those founding fathers, I'm afraid they were mostly men, of the field are very important to know a bit about. And I know this is a short lecture, I can't go into depth uh, uh, here, but you can always ask me questions in class and also Angus and Iris, of course. But there are certain cultural thinkers which are very important to understand the field, to work as you will, will in this course with games and play and history and past, and also to, um, yeah, develop your own conceptual knowledge of what play could mean for you in your work. The first one is um, very close to home, I would say almost, Johan Housinga. And some of you may be aware that Johan Housinga was a professor here in Leiden, hence the building which was na named after him, and that he didn't only write about history, as a linguist historian he did that as well, like the autumn of the Middle Ages, which is still translated in many, many languages, but he also wrote about play, and actually his inaugural speech was about play. And here we have that. Homo ludens, proeve ener bepaling van het spel der cultuur. 
it's also this book has been translated in many many languages has been used in many fields not only in game studies and um, it's interesting because his archive uh, his academic work still resides in the library here at Leiden his more artistic work because he was also very good at drawing and he wrote other stuff as well, which was less academic, is still in The Hague in, in, uh, in, in, in the archives there. Anyway, what made this um, book a game changer is that it said something which may sound very obvious, but isn't obvious and still isn't obvious for some people now. He said there, play precedes civilization. And in fact, play is the soil of civilization itself. Never mind the word, well never mind, not maybe, but of course civilization is a very archaic word which we associate with certain ideas about superior uh, western culture etc which you may object to and that may be a criticism you could also give to Hausinger in retrospect but still it holds true I think what it's, he says here. If we just tweak it a bit and don't speak about civilization but about culture then it reads play precedes culture and in fact play is the soil of culture itself so actually everything we cr grow cultivate is sort of rooted in play and um, that is an interesting statement because still nowadays we often tend to think of play and games as frivolous, as not really meaning anything, as fun maybe as well. Fun can be important as well, mind you. But um, we tend to, and maybe also when you told to your parents that you were doing a course about games, they were maybe snickering a bit, I don't know. But I do get that a lot still, that other scholars go like, oh, you do play, well, hoo, hoo, hoo. that must be very... Um, yeah, they think it's a light thing. Well, actually, it may be have a light side, it may be fun, but at the same time it is how we experiment, how we find out about things, how we, um, how we imagine things. It's a very important principle of culture. And Hausinger was the first one who just stood up actually and said, look, this is serious, play is serious business and we have to understand play to understand culture. Now, an interesting thing as well is that in this book, which doesn't only talk about games, but also about court rooms, for example, he is very pessimistic about play. And he says, with the sort of emergence of all these technologies, we're talking 1938 here, right? Um, he is very much afraid that play will leave human culture and that actually it will be the downfall even of human culture. So, in this book, as I said, he said, civilization, culture arises and unfolds in and as play. He says, play precedes civilization, meaning children play, which may, he may found less um, civilized, uh, more wild still, but also animals play, for example. And in fact, it is the soil, so almost the manure, I would say, of civilization itself. It's where our culture grows the best on. Now in this book he goes further and he tries to define uh, uh, play in, in a more refined way and he does some interesting, uh, he makes some interesting statements about that which you may not agree with but they are still interesting to know. So according to Hausinger Play is about freedom. I think we can all agree with that, although there's sometimes a tension in where you can play and how much freedom you have because of the game rules, right? Play is voluntary. It cannot be forced. Indeed, if someone says to you, and you play now, the play is almost immediately gone out of what you're doing. Time, interesting as well, or important for this course, Playtime may be arrested at any time. So you can stop, for example, when you are playing a game on your computer to get a sandwich and then you come back. And then you come back to play. Play changes our perception of time. 
So at the moment that you are in, uh, in play, um, you have a different idea about how time passes, but you also get absorbed, again, very important for this course, in the time frame of the game you are playing. Game is play is a ritual. This is also very much still probably true, but at that time, around the uh, yeah in the 30s of the last century, many many scholars were thinking and studying rituals also in anthropology. So it's infinitely repeatable because that's the thing which rituals are, and it takes itself seriously because rituals have a very important serious. Um, a function within cultures. It is rule-bound. Rules give play symmetry and order. So there's a bit of a tension here between the freedom statement of Housinga and the rule-bound uh, idea he had. And as soon as the rules are broken, play stops. He was quite moralistic in that sense, that when people bend or break the rules, they're cheating, he thought then the play is over. And of course we all remember that, right? You're playing a game, someone's cheating, and you throw the board game to the side because you said this is no fun anymore, or you were cheating. But of course there are many layers and different ways of cheating, which can be actually also very playful. It transcends all other forms of human experience, hence the importance he gave to it. It's autotelic, so it has no goal outside itself. That's an interesting one, because I will come back to that in a moment when I talk about his idea that play can't have any goal out of, out, outside of itself, and therefore when you start to make money out of playing, um, it's not a game anymore, according to Housinga. And then the last notion, which uh, is important, and I will uh, expand upon a bit more, it's circumscri circumscribed area, a tover circle, or a magic circle. And that has become a very important concept uh, after the year 2000, both for game thinkers as for game makers that it's a sort of delineated area, whether it's the card table, a theatre, a playground, the computer screen, or a monopoly board. This is Housinga, as well as a, a drawing a friend of his made for his inocular speech, which was also about play. Play, as I said, is autotelic, according to Housinga, and that means that he also says that play is absolutely free of economic interest because then if it has economic interest attached to it it has a goal outside itself so no profit game can be gained by it so all the football games but also people who play games to uh, earn money chess for example um, then according to housing that's not a play anymore and that's of course very um, well it's tricky to maintain that because we have many forms of play which actually ha have an economic interest um, related to them. Play is display, he says as well. It's performative. Play always represents something. So according to Housinga, a chess board, for example, represents a battlefield. We also have games which represent a landscape. So that re notion of representation, which have, has been lately uh, also um, um, criticized and um, problematized, is for Housinga very important. Now, as I said, Housinga wrote his piece or his book in 1938. Uh, his ideas were taken up quite quickly after that. He also did already travel abroad to give speeches um, about it or lectures in English, for example, about his work. But in 1958, so exactly 20 years later, it was picked up by the sociologist philosopher in France, Roger Caillois, who wrote a book which can be seen as a critique and refinement of the work uh, Homo Ludens. And that book is called Les Jeux et les Hommes, and it has also been translated in many languages, so I'm sure you can get hold of it. Um, it's also in the library of Leiden. I mean, not the original, but uh, copies are there too, available for you to read it. 
And what he does there, he adapts Huizinga and actually also starts to make a categorization of what kinds of play there are. Here you see his very famous um, um, table, and it's a bit rigid, I would say, but it still gives you some sort of a, it, it, it helps you to think about what kind of play you're dealing with. So on, on, the, on the one axis you have Paida and Ludus, in which Paida is more free, less ordered play, which according to Hausiger wouldn't be really play, right? And Ludus is more ordered play, and it's a sliding scale. So often, uh, Kaiwa would say children are more on the Paida side and grown-ups more on the Ludu side, according to Kaiwa. And then he also makes uh, four categories, competition, charms, simulation, and vertigo, vertigo being more a physical uh, kind of play. And he says those kind of playful activities can be more ordered or less ordered, so more towards Paida or to more towards uh, Ludus. Now, I talked briefly already about the magic circle, and that idea of the magic circle was also taken up by other scholars uh, after Housing wrote his book, and is still being hotly debated, actually. Um, there's lots of stuff being written in game studies of people who are for the notion, against the notion, try to find solutions uh, to overcome certain problems with that notion. Um, one person, and it's, it's a tough read, I must say. I, I read it, of course, myself, and I, it's not easy. One person who really um, criticized uh, Housinga is Jacques Ehrman. Uh, now we're talking 1968, so we're 10 years later from the book of Kaiwa. And he has a problem with the delinea delineation of uh, play from the rest of culture. He's, he says that's, that's strange, right? On the one hand... Housinga says, it is culture, it's the soil of culture. And on the other hand, he sort of, yeah, puts it separate, uh, apart from culture. So in his uh, uh, view, and here's a quote, in an anthropology of play, play cannot be defined by isolating it on the basis of its relationship to an a priori reality and culture like there's a reality outside and the game does something else. To define play is at the same time and in the same movement to define reality and to define culture. Hence, if it is a ritual which gives shape to culture, how can it be outside of culture? Another moment in time when actually the cri cri criticism on the concept of the magic circle became more sort of palpable was in the in the later uh, in around 2005 when scholars in game studies started to look at pervasive games and these are games you play for example in an urban environment or in a wood could be as well a larp for example but in which uh, you take the normal um, environment of daily life as a sort of you could say gigantic game board to do a game. And then, of course, these yeah, connections between what other people do in normal life and what you do as a player become far more problematic and they start to merge sometimes, right? You could also sometimes have a bystander who starts to become part of the game, for example. And uh, one of the people, Marcus Montela, uh, a, a Finnish uh, scholar, actually now he works for the game industry, but he used to be a scholar, um, wrote from that perspective of studying these pervasive games, which were quite um, hip at that time uh, when he wrote this. For example, you can look up Blast Theory, which is a, um, a UK-based collective of artists who used sort of devices within city uh, cities to create uh, games. Um, and they observed those uh, games and they said, yeah, but hang on, if you look at this, it's very, very difficult to see where the magic circle begins and where it ends. So with these games that have salient features that, um, you know, the, the contractual magic circle, so when you uh, have arranged, when you step into the magic circle, become uh, 
they at least expand or they become permeable. And that's, according to Montelà, uh, the case both on a socially, spatially and temporal level. Another quite important scholar who does criticize the magic circle at one point in his book directly, but for the rest makes his own theory of play, uh, is Brian Sutton Smith. Um, he became very old, so at the first conference in, in, in Utrecht in 2003, he was not there because he was already quite old, but he was there by video link. He gave a lecture by video link there. But his work is built on a total different idea of play than that of Huizinga. Let First of all, he's not that interested in whether games of play are rule-based or not, or immoralistic things about cheating or not. For him, play is indeed everywhere. It's not bound to a certain domain. For example, he has lists of playful activities. Can be drinking in the pub, can be um, doing uh, uh, crosswords, can be also daydreaming, for example, but also extreme sports. So play is not bound to a certain domain, and it's also not bound to a certain age, so it's both spatially and temporally very versatile. And he actually makes a total different way of looking at play uh, from uh, someone like Kaiwa, who's quite rigid in that table. He says play comprises of many activities, or what he calls states of minds. So, for example, daydreaming, as I just mentioned. The last scholar I want to mention here is who is important, especially uh, if you look at play from an anthropolo anthropological uh, uh, perspective, and also actually is not on the same page as Huizinga, is uh, Clifford Geertz, and he talks about deep play. And deep play is a ritual uh, activity he studied in uh, Bali uh, in his work as an ethnographer, and there actually the the betting on, on, on cockfights um, is very important for all kinds of social relations in that community. And he says, you can't say that that's outside of society. It's very much pivotal to society. And also it's about um, um, gambling. It's about money. It's about gain. It's about economical interest. So he says, you can't keep you can't say, as Housing Hasir says, that play is autotelic. And to quote him, in pre-modern societies such as Bali, or what Housing and Kaiwa would call savage or primitive, which are of course very problematic words like we are less savage or we are left less primitive, they're of course also very complex societies. In those societies, the economy is based on deep play like gambling, and play is not divorced from economic interest at all. So for him, play is not autotelic, and actually it creates reality and is not outside of it, as some crit crit criticism, a criti people have critiqued as being a problem with the magic circle. So, this was a very short overview of a very complex and versatile field. Um, what I want you to take away from this lecture is that play is anyway. We can stay part of culture, maybe not of civilization, and yet also still culturally dependent. I mean, the cockfights are different from, from a game of chess, for example. They are from all times, so we have all, as we will see in this course as well, there, there is an archaeology of play possible. And actually, in that archaeology, you could say that video games or mobile games are just a new manifestation of a sort of certain human and also more than human, if we talk about dogs playing, for example, activity, which is very important for how we make sense of things and how we also cope with things as we have seen uh, during this COVID-19 period in which people use play as well to keep their space in their mind while our spaces are shrinking. 
Uh, play is very much rooted in the past, as we will show you in this course, and also great for reflecting on the past, because it opens this space of the imagination. Thank you for listening, and bye for now.